And again, I urge you to uh, go to your uh, sites to get the bi full biographies of our participants. Um, they include um, Scotty Kirkland, who was a historian and writer and, and a staffer at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Uh, Shamia Washington, who is the founder, director, and spirit behind the Scottsboro Boys Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, without Shalia, there would be no Scottsboro Boys Museum and Cultural Center. And Kiara uh, Boone, uh, who joins us from Equal Justice Initiative, where she is the deputy program manager. And um, Kiara, of course, is going to talk to us or to uh, engage us with uh, EJI's uh, marvelous project, soil collection project, and uh, Lynchy Museums. So this is really uh, about museums. I'm going to start off and say a few words about our own experience here, our own jazz experience uh, with museums, and then I will turn the panel over oh, first um, to Kiara, and then to Shalia, and then finally to Scotty. Uh, but the questions that we're uh, hoping to engage in this uh, piece of our work are uh, fourfold. First of all, uh, we want to explore how museum practice can facilitate a search for the truth uh, that allows communities that have been separated and that have uh, differing narratives about the past uh, to, uh, to uh, meet one another. Uh, second, th secondly, the question is, uh, and this is really a question for Kiara and EJI, is what role the state should play in our memorial practice and particularly where uh, the memorials are opposed to official versions of history, uh, is there a place for the state and what is uh, what should that place be? I think uh, Chief Roper gave us some sense of that this morning, uh, but every political leader uh, and official is not going to be as open-minded and as progressive as he appears to be about the place of the past and our current work. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, we want to think about the way in which museums uh, and memorial practice influence our understandings and our work with current issues. Um, so how do we use our memorial practice in our museums to speak to uh, or to stimulate uh, discussions about uh, contemporary threats to equal justice and uh, encourage participation in the campaigns around equal justice um, today? And then finally, you know, museums uh, do uh, uh, work in the field of trauma and memory, and they also use uh, personal stories uh, to, uh, to, to uh, illustrate um, events. Uh, and, but they also challenge us to uh, understand how these personal stories, for example, the personal story that we just heard from uh, Pamela Pierce, uh, can be used to filter understandings of the larger political context in which people lost their lives to violence. Uh, and certainly, uh, Ms. Pierce has done that in part for us by situating the story of her uh, grandfather, Bart Bush's story, in the economics of that moment. Um, and, uh, so, so those are the large questions that we are uh, looking um, to address here. Uh, I uh, have a piece on, on the site, and, and I won't repeat it all, but uh, I will say that uh, CRRJ is very proud to have uh, one of the uh, exhibits at the Smithsonian uh, reflect the work that we did on a particular case. Uh, the case involved the lynching of a man by the name of John Jones, John C. Jones, in Webster Parish in 1946. Uh, Mr. Jones had come home from the war. He had been seen, uh, he was actually a war hero, uh, fought in battle with the Bulge, uh, and returned uh, to Minden, which is a town in Webster Parish, the uh, county seat in Webster Parish, with a German revolver. Uh, that, that his presence back uh, in, in the parish and in Minden, uh, having been at the war, been out of town, stopped picking cotton and returning with a weapon, uh, was seen as a threat to uh, local whites who uh, who a completely cooked up charge, ended up uh, uh, taking him uh, and his young 17-year-old nephew uh, to a bayou uh, outside of Minden, uh, uh, kidnapping them, by the way, from the jail in Minden. 
and taking uh, them to a body and uh, beating them uh, to death, beating them, taking them, uh, stripping them of their clothes, beating one of them to death, and beating the other. Uh, four dead, he actually survives. Uh, and it is, it is the survival of the 17 year old that ultimately led to a federal uh, prosecution, um, uh, one of the first federal prosecutions for a lynching case in 1947. Um, I say all that to, uh, to describe a trip that I took with one of my students to Minden uh, in 2011 to, uh, to uh, investigate this case. There we met the head of the Dorchi Museum. The Dorchi Museum is a quasi-private uh, museum that purports to show the history of the Dorchi region, and in particular of Webster County. And the gentleman who escorted us around the county is the local historian. Every county has one. Uh, this guy is the, the keeper of the history of the area. Uh, we went into the museum and we saw a huge photograph uh, on the wall uh, that showed uh, downtown Minden in 1946. And we asked the gentleman, where did this photograph come from? Uh, and he said, oh, well, that came from the case files in the lynching case so, of uh, John Jones. So we asked him, well, is there anything else in the museum about the lynching of John Jones? And indeed, you know the answer. The answer is no. All there was was this one photograph showing uh, downtown Minden. The reason the photograph had been taken by the lawyers uh, was to orient the jury to this place where the kidnapping took place, uh, and, you know, to use as an exhibit in the courtroom. And it turns out that John Hagen had several other photographs of the lynching, including the lynching, the photograph of a dead man uh, in the bayou. Uh, it's not, I'm sorry I don't have it up here. Uh, we collected all the photographs from that lawsuit. Uh, they were being stored in Fort Worth, Texas. And the student uh, managed to get all the photographs that were in the federal file, including the photograph of the lynched man lying in the bayou. And we posted them all on our site. And we got a call from the Smithsonian uh, when they were putting together their exhibitions, uh, asking us if they could use the photographs of John Jones. They weren't interested in the photograph of downtown Minden. <laughs> they were interested in the photograph of John Jones' prone body lying in the body, beaten to death. And also an absolutely stunningly beautiful photograph of uh, Mr. Jones, his wife, in uniform, his wife, and his child. They were all online and on the site for, the, for this conference, so please take a look. And so we told them that, of course, you know, these were in the public domain, they were part of a federal court case, and of course they could use them. They ended up in the Smithsonian. Long story short, in order to learn, if you are a person uh, raised in Webster Parish, a young person, say 21 years old, and you want to learn the history of your parish, you can go to the local museum, and you can learn about the tornado that hit the county. You can learn about the, the, the uh, spinning that took place in the county. You can learn about revolutionary activities in Webster County. Parish, sorry. There's not a word about John Jones. If you want to learn about John Jones, the most important case ever to take place in that parish that drew international journalists, you have to go to Washington, D, to D.C to the Smithsonian. There's something wrong with that picture. And that's, I'm not talking 10 years ago, I'm talking, what's today? October 2017. We have two museum practices. They are Jim Crow, we have a Jim Crow museum practice. The museums, many of the museums in these small counties are run by Daughters of the uh, Confederacy uh, and their relations. They are the keepers of the historical record. Uh, and, uh, and there are some small African-American museums that do not have access to the same records. That has got to change. Not everybody has the privilege uh, and the funds to go to the Smithsonian. We have to change that on the ground. That's what this workshop is all about. And I'm leaving it to these folks to lead the way in that regard. Kiara Blue. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Equal Justice Initiative, I'm really excited to be here with you all to talk about.
about um, our work and to learn from you about the efforts that you all are doing and the importance of telling these stories and raising these narratives so that we can begin um, and continue to think about what that means for our present but also, more importantly, our future. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar, the Equal Justice Initiative is a human rights nonprofit organization based in Montgomery, Alabama. We were founded in the late 1980s as an organization representing people on Alabama's death row. And since that time, our work has expanded to represent children in the criminal justice system to challenge mass incarceration, excessive sentencing, um, and all the other contemporary issues that we have in our criminal justice system today. And we do all of that work through the lens of understanding our history of racial and economic injustice. For us, you can't begin um, a conversation about reform in this space without having a conversation of how we got here in the first place. Understanding the evolution of these systemic issues and the ways in which they shape our policies, our laws, the ways in which we interact with one another every day. And to do so, we look at it through this narrative arc um, that looks at the history of genocide in this country, the, how we treated Native people, uh, the enslavement of African Americans, this era of racial terrorism and violence and lynching that we spent a lot of time in the last couple of hours discussing today. The history of the Civil Rights Movement was looking at the actors who were in positions of power and authority to resist the courage of um, the foot soldiers of the movement and how all of those systems have laid the foundation for this current era of mass incarceration where we see a disproportionate number of poor people and people of color incarcerated. With this narrative arc, we are really engaging in this work because we um, have tried to bring about issues of uh, racial discrimination in the criminal justice system through the courts. And because of a long history, which I will defer to great, greater legal minds to talk about, um, it's a bit challenging. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to create understanding and community about how this history has shaped where we are today. And so, in order to do that, we have to understand what the true and accurate history is, and who gets to determine what the true and accurate history is. And a lot of that is a power dynamic in and of itself. Um, so what we try to do is to introduce this perspective from those who have been oppressed by these systems. And so one of those projects is um, the effort to produce materials, public education materials, so that you don't have to be an attorney or a historian to understand what this history was and how it connects. And so um, as you came in, you probably saw the table with a lot of our materials. They're free. Please take them. And these reports really try to spell out the research that our team has done over the years. The other component has been building spaces that people can visit um, that is in the museum tradition to begin to engage with this history in a very meaningful um, way. So one of those projects is building a museum that will be titled From Enslavement to Mass Incarceration, where we will walk people through that history and that continuum. The second project is um, based on our research documenting over 4,000 racial terror lynchings from the end of Reconstruction up until the start of World War II. Um, which will be the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. In this memorial, we are attempting to create a space where people can come and actively reflect on this history of trauma and terrorism that has plagued uh, our communities, particularly in the American South. It's definitely something that we see pervasive throughout our country. Um, we have acquired about six acres of land in Montgomery, and we are partnering with a nonprofit architecture firm called Mass Design Group. <coughs> Their first U.S. based project. There are other projects um, where in Kigali, Rwanda, where they helped build the Genocide um, Memorial Museum there. And this is a structure, which I think we have a short video we can show you, um, that will create these over 800 columns that represent each county or parish um, where we document these lynchings.
engage in other acts of um, And Brian Stevens are joining us now from New York. Thanks for being with us on the program. I want to start That's by asking you first, where the civil rights um, attorney <laughs> at What was going through your mind? Welcome to you. Pictures over the weekend, these ugly trees being And in a few months, I was fired for uh, insubordination. 
vacation. So I lost my job uh, two and a half years before I had my full retirement in. So that gave me time to um, think about what to do. And um, I read the book, I started the book Foundation, all the Scott's Grow Multiple Cultural Foundation. But in the back of my mind, I was aiming for one thing, Scott's Grow Boys Museum and Focus. So I knew if I would go after the 501c tax status and the Scott's Grow Boys name, I wouldn't get it. Because the powers to be in that town had me meeting behind closed doors, telling me not to do it. They didn't want to be known as that. Uh, give time for some of the elderly whites to die out uh, because some of their parents and ancestors served on the jury. Uh, Ava met with the founder of Scott's Girl's grandson. They came to the museum on a Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the winter months. It was dark. And he walked in and immediately told me, smiling, and his tea clothes to close that museum. We don't want it here. We don't want to be known with this. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, it's already written in history. And I owe no one for this museum. And thankful for a Jewish family, when the legislators, the local legislators back out gave me $75,000 to purchase the church where we are, a Jewish family heard that uh, we were trying to raise money. And because of the Jewish lawyer, Samuel Leibovich, they offered to give me the whole amount and they said, tell us what you need. And I said, I only really need half of it. Because they thought, they said this to me, if you come up with half, we'll give you the other half. And they knew that I had been turned down from the city and from the county. And uh, donations was coming in, but it was nothing like $37,500. So, the Jewish family had a check in the mail, $37,500 within five days of the city coming to us. And they sent the police chief, who was an ex clan member, to tell me at the museum in front of the board members, as long as I'm on the city council, you all are never to receive a penny. And we've been open seven years, and that stands to be true. We have not received any local funding from the city nor the county. We persevere to keep those doors open on the donations that people from around the world send us. And the four P's that I stand by is perseverance, patience, power, and prayer, which covers everything. And the reason that we're open today is because people come to that museum and they know the history of this case and how bad uh, those nine boys was treated. And it's in the top 100 cases of all times as one of the most important cases in the world. And so we've been open seven years as of February uh, this year, over 8,000 people, 13 foreign countries have come through the doors of that church that was built by former slaves. And we're getting ready to undertake a huge renovation uh, fundraiser to uh, remodel the building to make it talk to you when you walk in. And in the meantime, uh, people have started giving us things. For instance, we have the actual table that was in the jail cell. We have two jury chairs that was used for the trial. We have the keys to the jail cell and unlock the jail door. So, and then they gave us land. Land on the side for parking and a huge piece of land at the back of the museum <coughs> for a park. So was it the right thing to do with everything that went on and everything that I was told not to do? Uh, the threats that we got. Uh, the meeting behind the closed doors so many times. My dear aunt who died uh, right after the governor was on ready to divorce in 2013, she lived to see it. Sometimes it was just me and her that would show up at these meetings. And uh, one of the guys at the Chamber of Commerce, who was going to get us a $175,000 grant, we had a meeting at the uh, local legislative office. And he was so scared he wouldn't show up. They had to go get him and bring him to the meeting. And because
because of the work that I have. If you have anything to do with this Scottsboro Boys Museum, you're going to lose your job. So I was meeting and, um, until we got that 501c3 in 2009. I had no fear after that. And because of the great lawyer Samuel Lee, which you all call the forerunner of this movement, and because of the Jewish people that has donated over $50,000, that those museums were always open, um, what needs it? I applaud every civil rights leader that went out before me, that took a chance on their life, that stood out and spoke up against racial injustice. I applaud them to the highest, to every woman that took a stand in the civil rights movement. Because a lot of women did that we get recognition for. I applaud them also. It's a challenge, I, I, I'll tell you no one, it's a challenge to go after opening a civil rights museum, especially one of the standard that the truth didn't want to be told. Scottsboro still refused to accept this as their mistake. The state of Alabama still refused to accept this. And three other family members that's only been found as Clarence Norris's three children, after the governor exonerated them, they put in a lawsuit against the state of Alabama for a million dollars, and they've been turned down three times. So I have uh, called Governor Ivey's office. They don't want to give the children any money, give it to the museum for education, <laughs> restitution. So we can send someone to college and help. So we can teach our children about our history. Because the importance of a museum is to tell the story that we will never repeat what has happened before. We talked about lynching, we talked about murder. Uh, do we still see this going on today? Yes, in a different form. Everybody talk about Black Lives Matter. These nine boys' lives matter. And they had no one to speak for them, really. That Jewish lawyer stood up and came down and took no money for the whole time he represented them. And because of him, that museum doors are open today. And I say again, I applaud every civil rights leader, everyone that ever took a stand and wanted to take a stand. But being at 17, 18, I had no idea what I was thinking of. Why would I want to do something as big as this case? And because of this case, it set the uh, presidents of the report. We look over this case, and I have a problem with this, we look over this case, and we go to the Rosa Parks case as the movement. But before Rosa Parks, there was the Scottsboro Boys. Even in the uh, National Archives, they have her as the face of the movement. And one day, I'm going to have the Scottsboro Boys up there as the face of the because she only sat down on the bus and gave us a reason to ride in the front of the bus. These boys' lives were destroyed, but they set up the presidents in the courtroom. Then why shouldn't we recognize them as the face of the civil rights movement? And I'm here today to make sure that those doors stay open. And our historian is here today, Dr. Tom Reedy, and he's going to give us a presentation, a short look at what's about to happen at the Scottsboro Boys Museum. Seven years later, we're about to turn this museum into the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping people will come again from all over the world. Like I said, 13 foreign countries, over 8,000 people. Was it the right thing to do after being threatened? I had to send my two children away one time from my house because of the rent. So thank you very much. <laughs>
We're still here talking about Rosa Parks. <laughs> <laughs> so we so have another here. panelist after this doctor. So uh, we will we will go. I'll go fast. I'm just. Don't stop in too fast. But and the, then we have a full panel okay. at the end. So I just I got be you. mindful of the time. This is That's the video all. portion so of the show. Much. So we're we're redoing the museum. The museum is held in the old Joyce Chapel in Scottsboro. It's an old African American uh, church. Uh, it was constructed in the late 19th century, just 30 years or so after the Civil War. So undoubtedly, uh, many uh, of, the, of the people building this would have been former slaves. So there's a spirit to this museum that's special. Uh, <laughs> the layout here, I'm going to show you real quickly, is basically two parts. The original uh, chapel on the right-hand side, uh, and then this annex that was built in 1948. As we are redoing it, we one of the, probably our main goal was to retain the, uh, the sense and spirit of the chapel. So when you walk in, even though we're repurposing a lot of the space, you will notice that it still feels like you're in the church. And we do feel it, and it feels strongly that this case is a spiritual center of the uh, a longer civil rights movement. So if we can advance then. Okay, this is the outdoor of the museum uh, that you can see. Uh, we've, we've redesigned the logo, and we can, we can move on. That you walk in. Um, it, has anybody been to the museum here? Okay, so we've seen it. That's kind of been there. Um, but yeah, you can pass to the next one, but I'll, I'll, we'll start here. So uh, on the right hand side, what we did is we removed a couple pews and built this faux wall with uh, ghosted images and plexiglass of the nine uh, individual defendants in the case. Uh, we're going to start off the journey by telling you who they are as individuals because soon enough we're going to talk about them collectively. But the, we, we do have to remember these were, these were young men ages 13 to 20 uh, when they were arrested. Okay? Uh, and if we could go on. Um, the first thing you see then is you, we're going to put it in context. What are we talking about? Scottsboro, or this, these, are people, these, these are young men who are falsely accused and sent to prison. So we have an actual jail cell. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> excuse me, Sheila mentioned the table that we have. Um, and we, can, we can go forward here. And this is an image that we're using again of the, uh, of, uh, it comes from a photograph of the Scottsboro boys. Uh, by the way, the, the, the uh, design, design firm is out of Birmingham and design display. And they also worked with, they did the Jesse Owens Museum. They, I believe they did part, some parts of this. I'm not sure about that. They did the Greyhound Bus Museum in Montgomery. Uh, I think they worked in the voting, uh, voting rights in Selma and uh, so, some other ones. So they, they have uh, their experience with working with small uh, museums that are constantly trying to scrap up funds and have an idea, but uh, it takes longer than some bigger bigger organizations. All right, so now the, the guests has come into the, come into the chapel, come into the museum, and now they're going to tour in the next two slides you can show quickly. Uh, they're going to see the context behind uh, the arrest. So the first, the first uh, panel's on Jim Crow. We'll talk about the Jim Crow Society. Then we'll talk about poverty, okay? Because remember, 1931 is at the height of the Great Depression. And then finally, the uh, the third panel on the side is the arrest. Go one more, thank you. And the way that the um, the choir section is the spiritual center of a, of a chapel or church, we made the courtroom the center here. And what this does, what we're doing here, is we are reenacting the second trials that were set in Decatur. Uh, it's, it's the one that's most publicized, but it's also the one that's most uh, in some ways, the most compelling and, and the most teachable, because you have you have all the elements, uh, or many of the elements and forces that kind of drove this this uh, terrible tragedy. So you have on uh, on trial Haywood Patterson. Okay, this is going to be when this is done. He will look like it's a mannequin that will look more like Haywood Patterson. Okay, uh, and the far left is kind of hard to see, but that's going to be Victoria Price. And she's the main accuser. By this time, the other accuser would be Bates and McKinley. Well, during this trial, she recants. Uh, Victoria is looking away from justice. So she's looking out away from the court. Uh, Haywood will have his head down, uh, sort of defeated, uh, and sort of at the mercy of, of this decision here. The, uh, it's hard to see what we blended in these figures of Sam Leibowitz on the right, Thomas Knight on the left. 
and sitting in the chair uh, was Judge Horton. And behind them is a rear on the wall. So it, it, it's going to, you know, we're going to try to make this look like a, a fully integrated sort of courtroom scene. And then we have uh, other, uh, uh, you know, you can kind of see what, what that is. So that, uh, the, the guests in the museum will come across here, will absorb all that, and then we have educational panels. Four of them, they talk about the trials, they talk about the competition between the International Labor Defense, and this Robin Cow was talking, probably talked about the ILP and the NAACP. And NAACP. Well, this is where it was, uh, this was, uh, was played out uh, throughout the Scottsboro case, but especially in the first two or three years. Um, we, we have this all done now. This is the last batch of PDFs I got from the designer, so it's actually more finished looking, but you'll get the idea. Uh, and as we go, remember I told you the other room is the annex, and this is uh, that the annex will be a little bit more interactive, a little bit more of a place where people can, after going through this, the, the sanctity and ceremony of the of, of the of the choir area, we will go into the annex area, uh, and you'll see as you look in from here uh, a poem by Langston Hughes, uh, Eight Black Boys in a Southern Jail, World Turn Pale. On the side here, Langston Hughes came to Alabama in 1932. He came to visit the Scottsboro Boys. He interviewed people as he was here, and he wrote several poems. And he left from here to go to Russia. And when he went to Russia, he actually brought a lot of this. Uh, he, he talked to a lot of people over there about what's happening in Scottsboro. Of course, they do already uh, from the newspapers. But this, this, this uh, involved a lot of the, the, the communist. Uh, and uh, actually created a, a great uh, marketing opportunity for international companies. Okay, and then uh, on, on this wall, these walls don't exist now, we're creating these walls here, but this one shows time served. Again, all nine were falsely accused, there's no rape that ever happened. Uh, but it's, it, it, none of them died in prison, none of the defendants, but they served a total of 102 years for a crime that never happened. So this, this shows uh, what happened. Uh, when they're released and the, and the, and the uh, nature of it. Okay. Uh, and this is our annex. So we, we're putting our gift shop here in the middle. This is a small museum, so we, you know you only have so many rooms. So we're trying to we're trying to figure out a way to do this in our design. So let's put this right in the middle. Uh, you can sell your books, your your coffee cups, your T-shirts, and things like that in that nature. Uh, there at the that kiosk. Uh, on this wall, you have Mike's good views, uh, and the wall over here, you know, we don't really have a good photograph in here, but this is the wall of protest. It's going to show more of the international protest, and, uh, and then all these uh, shadow boxes, these shadow boxes are going to look a little different, be bigger, but this is the current memorabilia and, and uh, things that we have in the trial we're going in there. So you'll actually be looking at not just murals and not just, you know, uh, poems like this, but you'll actually be looking at real uh, items from that, from that era. Okay. okay, this is kind of a cool wall too, so I'm going to go all the way to the left here. So we're running a uh, five to seven minute loop on uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and just posing a question, you know, uh, fact or fiction. Most of our, I, don't, I mean, would you say most of our grade school guests come to Scottsboro just uh, to kill a mockingbird? I mean, it seems like it seems most, most, yeah, so we get a lot of uh, from from uh, probably sixth grade up into high school, and they come and they read to kill a mockingbird, and they think of coming to the Scottsboro Museum, and we love them and we welcome them, and we have a conversation about uh, we you know let's we have that conversation. I learned so much from these kids because they just every every time they come in, they just read the book and they have all these questions. And they, they they come up with things. Oh, this is like this. This is like this. Uh, you know, at some point we'll talk about what Harper Lee who wrote to kill a mockingbird said. But, um, so that'll be in there. Um, as we as we go forward, this is the uh, this this is Scottsboro Boys the musical. This we'll talk about some of the more recent manifestations culture in the Scottsboro uh, the Scottsboro case. Uh, if you haven't seen this play, it was nominated for that is eleven or twelve Tonys. Um, it's now touring. So get a chance. I've seen it in D.C. in uh, in, in the spring. Okay. Okay, so now we're back into the uh, church area, and this is what I call the legacy wall. It's like, okay, it's a tragedy, this is horrible, we get it, we understand these, these nine lost their lives, but what did it all mean? What was the sacrifice for? Was it, or was it for anything? Was it just something bad that happened in the past? 
Well, we think from studying the case, there is a legacy to this, and we're going to discuss uh, some of the legacy, some of the people like for a good Potter show, like Sheila's favorite, Rosa Parks, who got their cut their teeth uh, during the Scottsboro Boys uh, protest that really drew a lot of people into uh, into civil rights. Then we're going to go one more. Uh, you can skip one more. This this last area is done. If you go back home, sorry. This last area is going to be uh, talked about the pardons and exonerations. Uh, Clarence Norris was the only Scottsboro boy uh, who was pardoned in his lifetime in 1976. George Wallace pardoned him. The other uh, others were exonerated or pardoned uh, in 2013. A ceremony held in the Scottsboro Boys Museum. And the last panel here, we're still working out what we're doing with this. My original thought when we were first doing this was it was going to be more geared toward Black Lives Matter. Um, and that'll be some element of it, but it's sort of like we feel, okay, we've, we've taken people on this journey in our museum, we've talked about what happened, we've talked about its legacy, let's see some of the achievements of this, the protest. But what can you take out of here when you go into the, out to the streets? What can you take from this museum uh, with you? So that's the panel that's going to talk about that. But we do know we're juxtaposing uh, protest uh, photographs from the 30s with the current either uh, BLM or other civil rights protests. So we're going to do that in the last panel. And then you walk out and what, I think I got one more panel. Yeah, and that's an important one. If anybody's interested in getting their name up at one of those blue signs there, uh, you can talk to me or Sheila anytime. 24-7, we're, we're there for you. Okay, uh, and I think we're, these are just different views. You can just go through these quickly of uh, the museum. But that's what, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're down to the first phase, which is this design phase, we're in the fundraising phase, and um, we, the Birmingham firm says once we've raised our $90,000, they can come in and just do it, you know, finish it like in one week, so that's it, thank you, um, thank you. Entirely different 
story. The Prince began, uh, was walking from his home uh, to a meat store to, to, uh, to buy milk for his two very young uh, twin children. Uh, and, and as he was walking by this nightclub where there was a, an illegal craps game going on in the parking lot, um, the, the uh, squad car pulled up and uh, McCann was caught up in this and murdered uh, that way. And, uh, you know, Hannah called me one, one day in, I think, July or August of uh, 2013, and uh, she told me about spending time with uh, McCann's uh, twin children. We really never got to know him. Uh, and she, she interviewed them both about what they remember about the case. And then uh, they were looking at photographs, and uh, you know, a photograph of, of these two children uh, dressed in, in Sunday finery, sitting on the father's knee. And, and she said, uh, uh, the moon turned very somber, and, and the, 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 the claw of the sun said, uh, we were the ones left behind. And uh, you know, it, was, uh, it was a very good experience for her and a good one for me. Uh, most of the work that I've done on uh, civil rights in Mobile predates my time at the Department of Archives and History, so, so this is, is, uh, is part of my longer scholarly work, not, not so much my, uh, my job at the, the State Archives. But uh, on the website, and I won't re recount it here, but uh, on the conference website, I, I posted a little piece where I sort of got at this, this business of, of a, a community that's uh, a little different than, than what Ms. Washington has encountered in Scottsboro. Uh, Mobile isn't a community that, that doesn't want to hear about its civil rights, its racial past. It only wants to hear, I found, a certain version of it. And I think that's, uh, that's true in many communities. And so in, in the piece that I wrote on the, uh, on the conference blog, I try to reconcile um, really these two monuments that stand about two blocks from each other uh, in, in Mobile. They're not downtown, and they're not, they're not in, a, in a place that tourists typically go. Uh, the first one uh, was put up in 2008, and it's called Unity Point. Uh, and this is a, uh, a very small park uh, in a busy street, big um, seven-foot pedestal, water flowing on it. Uh, there are two men uh, standing there, uh, shaking hands, looking confidently towards uh, City Hall, about a mile. Uh, to their east. Um, and these two men are, are Joe Lane, who was a, uh, a notable white uh, politician, post-World War II politician in Mobile, uh, and John Fleur, who was a local postman who for uh, 50 years was involved in civil rights work in, in Mobile. From 1925 until 1956, uh, he ran the Mobile NAACP. Uh, and when the state outlawed the NAACP in the summer of 56, uh, he very deftly shifted the work to a shadow organization that he had also been running for 10 years called the Nonpartisan Voters Group. This was the expressly overt political arm of his work, work that was prohibited by the National NAACP because as he told Walter White one time, the only person in the NAACP that's allowed to endorse a candidate is you. And John Fuller thought that was crazy, so he and a couple of other uh, people started this organization. So these two men, uh, for a very brief time in Mobile's uh, long civil rights history, uh, had a mutually beneficial partnership. Right? They were. They. They. The way the narrative goes is that they worked together to to solve all of Mobile's racial trouble. They were these two beneficent, uh, uh, otherworldly individuals that came together and did this work. And, uh, and that's the narrative that, that allows uh, people in Mobile that want to make it to, to have the argument that Mobile was different. Mobile wasn't Montgomery. Mobile wasn't Birmingham. Mobile wasn't Selma. Mobile was different. It was a cosmopolitan board city. Uh, it was a very Catholic city. We all loved each other. Uh, and, and, and John Floor and Joe Langan shook hands and showed us the way. Uh, this is Unity Point. This is, this is endorsed by the by the, uh, by the officials there, uh, paid for with taxpayer money, uh, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollar statue there. This is the official, uh, acceptable, usable pass. Two blocks to the west of it, there's a much less august monument. Uh, it's a historic marker. It was put up in 2009 and paid for uh, with outside money, paid for by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, it's a monument uh, beneath a very uh, consequential tree. 
on a little street called Hearns Avenue. And in 1981, now I always pause when I say that, so we can see again, but it was 1981, not 1881. Uh, 1981, on uh, the morning of March 23rd, uh, residents of Hearns Avenue found hanging from that tree in the body of a 19-year-old black man named Michael Anthony Donald. Uh, Donald, the night before, had been chosen at random by two members of the United Clans of America, uh, kidnapped, beaten, and killed in the woods in a neighboring rural county, uh, and then his lifeless body was brought back and, and displayed in this tree as a, as a show of clan strength and as a response for the case of an uh, African-American suspect who was acquitted for the murder of a white police officer. Uh, this case was, was actually initiated here in Birmingham and had been moved uh, to Mobile for pre-trial because of pre-trial publicity. So, so the case had nothing to do with, with Mobile. It certainly had nothing to do with Michael Donald. So he was, of course, caught up into this for, for no reason other than the color of his skin. Uh, life got short. Uh, and the, it takes about two years for the assailants uh, to be brought to justice. And then, of course, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, brings a civil suit on behalf of Michael Donald's mother, Julie May. Uh, and in that case, they, they Seven million dollar judgment of the bankrupts, the same clan that had uh, its members had been responsible for bombing the church next door, for murdering the Lord Rizzo in '65, and a host of other atrocities along the way. So that part of the story is well known. But in Mobile, and this is how I got to the story, I, I, I started my uh, scholarly work in Mobile looking at the Michael Donald case, looking at it, trying to, trying to just sort of examine it from start to finish, and when I backed up to do sort of a context chapter, that's when I really ran headlong into this, this acceptable, respectable narrative um, that really casts what happened to Michael Donald as an outlet that makes it not seem like it was connected in any way to the racial history of Mobile. Uh, and this is sort of, you know, one of the one of the goals that I had was was to. To, as, as Dr. Kelly said this morning, uh, to, to portray him as a young man, as a living, breathing person, and not just as, as, a, as a corpse, as other people who have written on Michael Donald, I'm afraid, uh, reduce him to. Uh, moving from that, I'll just say, you know, so th this is where I, I come to the idea of a, a place, a city that, that has a version of its history. And I cannot tell you how many times uh, in public forums that were group of us, several of us worked at the History Museum and other people have worked at some of the universities. Uh, Mobile has three universities, uh, two, two publicly funded uh, universities, a private school, uh, and we were lucky to have partnerships with all of them when I was at the museum to try to, to, to reach back and find something that was a little more complex, you know, to, to embrace a, a broader history of Mobile, and also just frankly to put Joe Lyon and John Floor uh, in context, you know, it struck me earlier today, I don't know if Kelly's gone, but uh, the John LaFleur that's on that statue, this is not the John LaFleur that Robin Kelly encountered when he wrote Hammer and Hoe. This is not the John LaFleur that I encountered when I did the historical research. Uh, and, and Susan Ashmore, who spoke earlier, she encountered Joe Langan uh, in some of her work, and, and this is not the Joe Langan that, that, that she remembers. These are, these are carbon, these are sort of Potemkin stand-ins for these great men. John Ford is painted as this beneficent, grandfatherly uh, sort of man who, who just, you know, just showed the way. Well, this is a man who was arrested several times for fighting with white passengers on streetcars. This is a man who, after he reignites a war by the NAACP <coughs> chapter uh, in Mobile, is such an effective organizer that 20 years before Ben Gregory was hired as Mississippi's field secretary, the NAACP is sending John LaFleur into Mississippi when the four uh, individuals were lynched in Monroe, Georgia in 1946. It was John LaFleur who went in and did the initial investigation. This is a man uh, who, was, who was deeply involved uh, in, in, in numerous things. And, and, and I always joke that, you know, here we are, we have these two men, and they're shaking hands, and LaFleur's hand is in his pocket. And I always joke that what he's holding in his pocket is a federal court. <laughs> is that yes, occasionally Joe Langan would come and, and work with John LaFleur to desegregate the library, to desegregate the public park, to desegregate a restaurant, but he did so because he was under threat of court action. 
So in, in, my, in my book, I, I sort of paint John Ford as using the, the federal courts and using the evolving civil rights laws as sort of his sword and his shield. He was a postman, and so he had, he had some federal uh, protections. Uh, as, uh, he had a federal job, so he was protected that way as well. Um, but I have to tell you, when, when we worked on the, the African American Civil Rights Trail uh, in Mobile, which I was involved with, I have about 50 sites now. Um, the founder of that, Laura Finley, was a, was a good friend of mine, uh, and since she has passed away, her family has sort of picked up. But we, we did all this very slowly. We, we very slowly chipped away. And I have to say, um, you know, I, I left Mobile in 2015, Laura um, passed away in 2014, uh, and, and there's much left to do, but you know, the, the beneficial relationship that Joe Lang and John Ford had has been so greatly exaggerated. It's almost muscle memory. Anytime I would go and talk to people about, about racial violence in Mobile's history, talk to them about the things that we were trying to do to to expand it, to talk about some of the, the mobile cases that CRRJ was investigating. Without fail, the first or second question I would get would be, but you're not from here, so you don't understand that mobile is different. You don't understand that we had John before in Joe Lane. And this was something that we encountered uh, on a regular basis, and we, we very slowly tried to chip away at it. Uh, I also was involved in a documentary project called Mobile Black and White, uh, and this started as an attempt to get at that question, to slowly work our way through in a, in a documentary, um, a, a more thorough picture of, of, um, of Mobile civil rights. That did what I try to do in my in my book that I'm writing on Mobile, which is not to throw out Joe Lane and John Floor, but to put them in proper context as just part of a much broader tapestry that includes, among it, a lot of African American women who are incredibly important to the story, who, who have never been acknowledged, and also the important role of those infamous outside agitators, uh, including some members from the American Friends Service Committee. So, uh, but as this, as, as Mobile Black and White developed, we realized that, that it was evolving from a strictly historical documentary to more of a, of a discussion of the immediate problems that were confronting Mobile. In 2010, Mobile flipped. It became uh, what some people call a majority minority community. This is where the population is now 51% African American, now it's 53%. Uh, and so we thought it was a good time to, to sort of reinvent this idea of the documentary and, and, and take time to look at where we are now and have, have uh, sociologists and, and different people speak on, on the, the endemic problems that, that the city was facing and how they were rooted in that and how we had to understand that past. Uh, we had a 90-minute version of the film that I'm pleased to say won a couple of, uh, of awards that had traveled for, for quite a while. Uh, and you can watch it online now. It's Mobile in Black and White. Uh, but we also had five 90-minute segments that sort of were deeper dives into institutional racism, economic uh, issues of economic inequality, social, social justice issues. Uh, and so we would have these work sessions where we would show this and break up into groups and we'd have these conversations. Uh, and it was very difficult because we had that same, you know, we confronted that same narrative. Uh, we found out after we did these a few times that we were quite literally preaching to the choir. Uh, as we went and looked at the attendance rosters, we found that some people were attending time and time and time. And we never were really cracking into the, uh, cracking into it. But I remember one time we showed it during a history conference. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of my friends who was deeply involved with it, she was taking the Q&A, she was an African-American woman. And this gentleman stood up and he said, this may all be true, but if blacks would just be more respectable, uh, none of this would happen. So it was this sort of weird reverse victim, victim shaming, victim blaming thing that, you know, and, and the, the, what happened, I'm afraid, is that you know, we all sort of First uh, museum, which I work for, was a city apartment that was privatized, and that was a good time for uh, for us to leave. Uh, several of the people that, that were involved in it have, have since taken other jobs, but uh, you know, I hope that, that when I finish my book, that, that it engages in some truth telling, uh, and that it helps to reignite that conversation. But the African American Heritage Trail is still active. Uh, they they continue to to produce markers. Uh, we say produce. Uh, markers that had a more difficult history to them. Uh, they, you know, marker programs are, are hard. Uh, I can 
attest to that, but um, you know, there there is a time and a place to have a discussion. It, it worries me sometimes when communities, uh, when those discussions in communities don't come from the bottom up and spread out. It worries me when they're when they're, when they're dropped on their heads from the state or from a national level. Um, you know, it strikes me in the past nine months just how relevant all this history of Midway is. And we were talking yesterday about that. Uh, just a casual quote that I heard from John Lewis uh, after the National Book Award ceremony earlier this year. A reporter asked him what he thought about uh, the nomination of his fellow Alabamian Jeff Sessions for uh, the Attorney General. And he talked about the long arc of the voting rights. He talked about Selma. And then he said, you know, I feel like I've been called to live my life over. And it was, it was instructive to me that, that you know, these are things that, that sometimes are reciprocal. And then just this, just this past week, I think on, um, on Wednesday or Thursday, Barack Obama was speaking in Richmond, um, and he was talking about the, the, um, the, the disunity in some parts of our politics, the unity that's coming in our communities. He said, you know, this is how we rise. We don't rise by, by repeating the past, but we rise by confronting it and having honest conversations about it. And uh, you know, Mobile's not there yet. Mobile is getting there, there's a, a young group of progressive people that push uh, against that accepted narrative, and I was pleased enough to be a part of it, even though I'm not native to Mobile, which was something I was also thinking of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, uh, I, I always counter that by saying, you know, ten, ten years I've lived here, ten years I've been involved, uh, and my son was born, so he'll, he'll always be a, a native to Mobile, so to speak. And so, uh, it's my job as a father to try to help him learn something about the place where he can live. So that, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm very happy to be here and participate. Thank you.